Hello, Assalamualaikum. Um, my name is Sally Horna. I'm one of the legal fellows with Karis FBA. I have here. Assalamualaikum. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeffrey Wing. I'm an attorney and uh, the California Bar Foundation legal fellow at Care. Um, and so, thank you for joining us today. What we're going to be doing is talking a little bit about some of your rights, um, specifically with reference to um, law enforcement and FBI. And then um, Jeffrey will also be discussing the rights that you have at the border. So when you're traveling through airport, um, those are really important um, rights to know of and to be mindful of. Um, so before we start, we do want to mention a few things. Um, feel free to ask questions as we present. Um, if anything is unclear or you need some more clarification, um, we're happy to provide that. Also know that um, after after the presentation, we will have some time for Q&A. Um, so feel free to ask us, but if it, like he mentioned, if, like the brother mentioned, if it's a little bit more specific or maybe it contains some confidential information, um, we can talk um, We can talk further or we can also give you our business card so that you can contact our office and speak with us there, um, just because this isn't so much of a confidential space. And also because we are being live streamed and recorded, so we want to make sure that we protect your identity and your, um, your confidential questions. Um, okay, so let's begin here. I think we have this all set up. So what we'll be covering today, like I mentioned, some law enforcement interactions and then your rights at the border. Um, so to start, um, if the FBI contacts you, typically um, we've seen often in the Muslim community um, folks who are um, uh, contacted or uh, reached out by the FBI. Um, and just because the FBI reaches out to you or comes to knocks on your door or at work, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, that's happening because you've done anything wrong or it doesn't mean that they think you've done something wrong. There could be a number of reasons. Um, oftentimes what happens is that they'll contact one person and then they'll have a conversation with them and then that will lead to finding out more information about someone else and then they kind of just start to talk to more people in the community and then all of a sudden you have 10 people from the same mosque who have been reached out to by the FBI. Um, so just so you have your um, yourself protected and your family protected, be sure to um, kind of follow these these guidelines that were provided for you when you if you do come in contact with the FBI. Um, so the first thing to know um, is that it is actually dangerous to speak with the FBI for a couple of reasons. Um, the first reason being that they can lie to us. So they can lie to us and provide false information or ask us questions, um, but we cannot lie to them. So even the smallest um, distinction in some information that you provide can actually lead to serious consequences for you and your family. So even if you make an innocent mistake, unfortunately, um, you know, if they hear something incorrectly or you say something correctly but they write it down incorrectly, that can still be considered um, a lie or misinformation and that can be used against you. So it's really important that you are mindful when you speak, if and when you speak with the FBI. Um, so now, now that we have an idea of what can go wrong when you talk to the FBI, um, if we uh, just know that we can't let them into our homes um, without an attorney present. And so then it begs the question, what rights do we have? Um, so, first off, you do have the right to remain silent. Um, what that means is that you don't have to speak with the FBI, um, and in fact, you have the so you have this right to remain silent. And to do that, you just assert the right by saying, "I want to speak to a lawyer," and remain silent. So those those are the key. That's the key phrase. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak with my lawyer. Um, it's not enough to say, I think I should have a lawyer, or I think I want to talk to my attorney, I don't think I want to talk to you. Those, um, those sorts of statements are not enough to assert the right. You have to say, I wish to speak with my attorney, um, and I do not wish to speak with you, or I wish to remain silent. Um, and if you've already started talking, you can stop talking with the FBI at any time because you hold the power when you're speaking with the FBI. So even if you've already started a conversation briefly, you can cut, you can and should cut it off as soon as possible. Um, the second right that you have, the FBI cannot enter your home without a warrant, your permission, or an emergency. And there are several different types of emergencies, such as um, if evidence is going to be destroyed or if they think someone is in danger. Um, but typically, if they're coming to your home to speak with you, it's not in those circumstances. And so, um, you do not have to answer the door, 
And if you do, the best thing to do is to open the door, step outside, and close the door behind you. But of course, making sure that the door is not locked so you don't lock yourself out. Um, but just so that they don't have a chance to look in or try to find anything, um, just so you're protecting yourself, your family, and your home. Um, because you do have a reasonable expectation of privacy within your home. We want to make sure that you are protecting that at all times. Um, so you can, of course, say, you can either say that you don't wish to speak with them, or um, you can step outside, close the door, and, and um, speak with them briefly or mention uh, asserting these rights of not of remaining silent or speaking with your attorney. Um, the third point, um, you should ask for the agent's contact information. So typically the FBI agents will carry around business cards with them that has their name, um, email, it, what agency they're with, um, and all of these. And so what happens is that once you have that information, and be sure to get the information of all the agents that are, that are there present, um, and then you can contact CARE as soon as possible. Um, so what we'll do in those instances is that we will represent you and we will um, speak for the FBI on your behalf. Um, and basically what we'll do is we'll ask what, you know, what, what would you like to speak to our client about, what sorts of questions are you asking of them, and then we will contact you and, you know, and kind of walk you through the process of whether you do want to speak with them or not, or what, for, what form of information you want to provide to them, if at all. Um, so of course that's all within your power, but certainly hold on to those business cards of all the people who are there, and then contact CARE as soon as possible. And so the, third, the fourth right that you have is um, a right to counsel. And what that means is that you have, a right to, you have a right to an attorney, and you can assert that right, like I mentioned earlier, by saying, I want to speak with my attorney. But the important thing to remember is that you don't need to have an attorney at the moment that you come in contact with an FBI agent to assert that right. So if someone comes uh, comes to my door, comes to my door and says, "I want to talk to you," you know, and if I'm not an attorney, I say, "Well, I want to speak with my attorney. Please give me your business card." I don't need to have an attorney at that time to assert that right. So if that happens, be sure to assert the right to counsel, assert the right to remain silent, and um, you don't have to let them into your home. Um, and so in, in the event, hopefully you don't speak with the FBI, but in the event that you decide you do wish to speak with the FBI, some things to be mindful of, um, certainly speak to your attorney or call CARE, um, call ALC, uh, which is the Asian Law Caucus. Um, we're also very close in, in communications with them to do this similar work. Um, and just speak with them, because if you speak to the FBI without legal representation, you can really expose yourself and your family to some harm, um, and, and it can just put you in a sticky situation that we don't want you to be in. Um, always tell the truth if you're going to speak with an attorney, uh, excuse me, always speak, always speak the truth if you're going to speak with an FBI agent, um, because lying or making false statements is considered a felony, and we want to make sure that we are protecting your rights and your liberties. Um, like I mentioned, they can lie to you, but you cannot lie to them, and even a small mistake can lead to a lot of serious consequences. Um, the agent, like a, uh, the agent, is not allowed to search your cell phone without a warrant or, um, or without your permission. And so, if an officer tries to examine your cell phone, um, do not physically resist, but say, "I do not consent to the search. I do not wish for you to look through my phone. I do not give you my permission." So, making sure that you are asserting those rights because. Again, they don't have the right to look through your phone without a warrant or without your permission. Um, and if you do have a pending application for your immigration benefits or if the FBI references any pending application, be sure to consult with an immigration attorney first because there are different sorts of protections and, um, and other sorts of consequences to be mindful of um, when you're talking about immigration rights, um, your immigration status, and the FBI. Um, so a couple of takeaways from this first portion that I mentioned. Um, first, it is dangerous to speak to the FBI alone, so be sure um, be sure that if they come in contact with you, you, you stop that interaction as soon as you can. Um, secondly, it's dangerous to let them inside your home. You also have a right not to let them inside your home, so be, please be sure to assert that right. Um, and then third, it's really important to use the key phrases, I do not wish to speak with you, please give me your business card and I will have my attorney contact you. You should practice this at home, um, or even write it on a postcard or a, on a piece of paper and you know put it um, by the door in case you forget, because the worst thing that could happen is that they do come to your door and all of a sudden we're blanking on what to say and how to be prepared, um, even though you were you know prepared and did come to this Know Your Rights presentation. So um, if you can, uh, definitely write that and let everyone in your home know. 
um, so that you are not the only one that is um, the one to assert that right. Anyone in the home can assert the right. So just be, be sure that you are practicing and you know the lines. Um, and again, it's I wish to remain silent. My attorney will contact you. Um, please give me your business card. So those three key things. Okay, so that was for the FBI, um, and this, for the FBI specifically, and this is um, the rights that you have with police or federal, other federal agents. So, um, you don't have to answer any questions if you're talking to the police, but just know that if you, uh, but providing your, excuse me, providing your identification information, um, if asked, can really help you avoid arrest or for the harassment or um, any sort of consequences. Um, do not reach into your bags without telling the officer that you're about to do so. So for example, if you get stopped by the police, the um, most important thing to do is to have both of your hands visible on the wheel, and once the um, officer comes and speaks to you, be very clear about what you are doing. So say things like, officer, I am taking my right hand and I am reaching it into my bag to find my driver's license. So just verbalizing, it seems really silly to have to say those things, um, but in order to protect you, your life, and um, basically, essentially with what we've seen in the um, in the news with um, unnecessary killings, we wanna make sure that we are taking all the precautions that we can to ensure that we are being as safe as possible. So be sure um, to mention what you're doing when the police officer is there. You know, I'm reaching my right hand into my purse to reach for my um, identification. So just being very explicit about that. Never give any false information um, or never assert any false identity. Um, and how do you know if you're, ever, if you're free to leave? You can just clearly ask, say, officer, am I free to go? Um, just asserting that question alone will let you know kind of where you stand and if they need more information from you or um, whether you feel like you're being what they call detained. Um, <clears throat> and certainly don't argue with the officer or run away, even if you think you've done nothing wrong or even if you think you, you know, this is an injustice that can just lead to further consequences that we really want to try to avoid. Um, again, like I mentioned earlier, officers cannot search your cell phone unless they have a warrant or your permission, so it applies to both the FBI as well as the police. <clears throat> um, if you're pulled over, definitely show your driver's license, registration, proof of insurance. Um, don't keep any suspicious looking items in the view of your car. Um, just, if anything, put them in your trunk. Again, just try, trying to eliminate the number of reasons that the police can harass you um, is really important. Um, and if you're home, if you're, you're home and the police or the immigration officer knocks, um, ask them to enter, again, you don't have to let them enter and it's probably best that you don't let them into your home. Um, and you can talk to them through a closed door. And if they do have a warrant with them, the best thing to do is to ask to see the warrant. Um, and so what you can do is have them put the paper right up against a window and you can read the warrant and it needs to indicate um, the location. Um, so it needs to be your address, uh, the people to be searched. So if they're trying to search you, your name needs to be on there. Um, and then it needs to be signed by a judge. So be sure to have, be sure that those elements are there. Um, you can also have them slide it under the door um, so you can review the warrant as well. So you have the right to review all of that. Um, if they do come with a warrant. But again, if they don't have a warrant, they don't have permission to enter your home. Okay, um, if you're asked about your immigration status, you have the right to remain silent and not be obligated to discuss your citizen citizenship status, and you don't have to answer any questions about where you were born. Um, if you have a green card, you are required to present it to an immigration officer upon request, um, and just be sure you're not carrying false information to present to um, law enforcement. If you find yourself under arrest, um, the police have the right to search for the area around you, and usually that's kind of like the wing, your, what they call your wingspan, so anything around, immediately around you is what they can search. Um, an officer should read you your Miranda rights before questioning you. And if you watch any of those cop shows, you kind of know what that sounds like. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you. That's really important for them to say to you if you are under arrest, um, and if you're, you are are under arrest and they don't provide you that um, Miranda right, then um, then there are different sorts of consequences for that. But be sure that they have read you those rights. And finally, um, you have the right to ask for the officer's name and badge number. Again, this is very important because if there has been an injustice or they've harmed you in some way, 
Um, having the affirmation is really crucial so that CARE and other organizations that are here to help can um, identify and best serve you with that information in hand. Um, I think that's all. Yes, oh, one final thing. Um, if you are under arrest, of course, be sure not to speak with the officers um, without a lawyer present. Um, that's really important in, in any context, but especially if you are under arrest. Um, so that is all the portion that I have for law enforcement and FBI. Do I have any questions pertaining to those specifically? Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Jeff and he's going to give you some more information um, about your rights. Thank you so much, Sally. Can everyone hear me okay? Yep. Perfect. So, like Sally just mentioned, um, or building off of what Sally just mentioned, the U.S. Constitution guarantees to every U.S. citizen an absolute, unqualified right to enter the United States. That means if you can prove your American, your United States citizen, citizenship, usually by showing a valid passport, then the government must allow you to re-enter the country. However, government agents at the nation's borders enjoy more power than police officers working in the interior of the country. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protects uh, Americans from random and arbitrary stops and seizures, but this basic constitutional protection does not, is not quite as strong when we're talking about uh, application at the border. And what do I mean when I'm talking about the border? That's land borders between Canada and Mexico, and also airports for international flights, as well as seaports when we're talking, thinking about like international cruises. Now, there's also, I believe, 15 airports in six different countries across the world, some in Canada, Ireland, the Caribbean, and also the United Arab Emirates, where U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, they have a program called pre-clearance, where travelers coming to the United States will actually be inspected by U.S. CBP prior to departing those airports or seaports in the foreign country, rather than when they come in here. But this doesn't mean that the border is a constitution-free zone. Uh, what rights people have at the border when traveling here and tra leaving the United States will generally depend on your citizenship or immigration status. So, your rights at the airport or at the border. Uh, Custom and Border Patrol officers generally have the authority to ask about your immigration status, and also they can ask questions to determine whether uh, you're a U.S. citizen uh, and whether you are who you really say you are to try to establish or uh, establish your identity. So, if you're a U.S. citizen, if you've presented your passport, you don't have to answer any further questions that go beyond establishing your identity and citizenship status. Border Patrol agents cannot actually stop you from entering the country, even if you refuse to follow their commands uh, or their requests. We've seen increasing number of incidents where CBP officers will request travelers unlock their phones, provide their passwords, or provide their social media accounts. If you're a U.S. citizen, you, you can uh, refuse to comply, and they can't uh, prevent you from entering the country simply because you refuse to comply. However, just know that if you do refuse to answer these questions, that might mean that you could your re-entry into the country could be delayed or you could be sent for more inspection. Now, some brief examples of the kinds of questions that CBP can ask you about. So they're allowed to ask you about your identity. Basically, who are you? And that's usually answered by showing them a valid US passport if you are a citizen. They're also allowed to see if you have a right to re-enter the country. And that's usually also answered by showing that you have a valid U.S. passport. They, uh, if you're, um, say, a naturalized citizen, they might ask you some additional questions uh, about your immigration history just to make sure it lines up with uh, what was originally in your immigration paperwork. Uh, and also, CBP officers are allowed to ask about whether you've committed crimes while you went abroad or whether you're trying to bring anything illegal into the country, that's also permitted. What is not allowed, however, is at the uh, border, they ask you questions about your religion, your political opinions, or personal questions. Those are not allowed. Now, if you're a green card holder, where it says LPR on the slides right there, uh, if you're returning from what, they, what um, is called brief and innocent travel, and I'll explain that a little, in a little bit, 
if you're returning from brief and innocent travel abroad and you present a valid green card, then you must be allowed to come into the country again. Now, brief and innocent travel, that generally means uh, less than six months to, uh, so most immigration practitioners say no more than six months. Uh, the longest perhaps allowable might be a year, but to be safe, no trips abroad for more than six months at a time. And innocent travel means no criminal, no criminal issues either here or abroad. Um, it's also worth pointing out. This is a good time to point out right now that uh, it, previously people with old criminal convictions may have been able to travel without issue under prior presidential administrations, but with the new current presidential administration, uh, these old criminal convictions could be an issue. So it's recommended that if anyone is seeking to travel abroad and they have any uh, criminal convictions, it's best to consult with an immigration attorney before doing so. Now, if you're a green card holder and at the border, Customs and Border Patrol uh, alleges that you've violated the terms of your green card, you have the right to see an immigration judge and you should assert that right. Uh, you do not need to sign, a, sign any documents that will renounce your green card, your LPR status. Only an immigration judge has the ability to revoke your green card. No, no border patrol agent can do that, uh, but oftentimes they do try to get people to sign away their green cards uh, because uh, they'll try to get them to sign these long convoluted forms uh, in English and not in the, uh, app, the green card holder's native language. So you want to be very cautious of that if that is the uh, type of status that you hold. Now, unfortunately for non-citizen visa holders, foreign visitors to the United States have the fewest rights. Uh, they may be denied entry to the country if they refuse to answer their officers' questions or they refuse Border Patrol agents' demands to unlock a digital device. Now, if regardless of your immigration status, whether you're a citizen, a green card holder, or uh, just a foreign visa holder, you can always ask to speak to a supervisor if you are concerned about, let's say, intrusive or excessive questioning that you were subjected to that go beyond establishing your identity and your citizenship. So if, say, the Border Patrol agent asks about your religious practice, your political beliefs, or about your, like, your religious community, those questions are intrusive and excessive. Those go beyond what's necessary in establishing your citizenship status. You can always complain to a supervisor. Additionally, you have the options of, after you leave the airport, um, there's something called the Transportation Security Administration have a, has a Traveler's Redress Inquiry Program. That's called TRIP. If you were harassed, searched, detained, or asked the truth of questions, you can come to CARE and we can, help you, uh, we can help you seek remedies through the TRIP program or also through the Department of Homeland Security's Office of Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. We can help you file a complaint too. So if, what happens if you're stopped or searched upon entry or leaving the United States? So like I mentioned earlier, generally at the borders, CBP officers may stop and detain any person and search any item at the border. Um, the law is actually unclear, a little unclear, about whether CBP has the power, the CBP power to search extends to digital devices. But in practice, CBP says that it, it can, and they often do search electronic devices, even if there's nothing that's otherwise suspicious about your luggage. Now, however, there are some limits, though, especially here um, in, in the, what's called the Ninth Circuit, uh, the West Coast. CBP can only uh, search what is stored on the device itself and not information that's stored in the cloud. So digital information that's, digital content that's on the device itself, they can't actually go into, or they're not supposed to search the, uh, what you might have stored in the cloud. And also, uh, any search of a digital device has to be what they call manual search. So they can't, use, they can't just go in there and use uh, some special technical software to perform a more forensic search of your entire device without, without having, like, say, a warrant or more uh, reason to believe that you've committed a crime. So, generally, they can, um, it's recommended that you do not give uh, CBP agents your password, even if they do ask for it. 
the law is actually a little unclear and or unsettled in this area if the government can force you to give up your password. Uh, there is, however, individuals who might think that they might face this situation need to do some sort need to do a self-assessment or some balancing because there are risks either way. There are risks if you refuse to give them your password, but there are also risks if you do end up giving them your password. So what what I mean by that is if let's say you are a non-citizen, you're a non-citizen visa holder, and re you refuse to provide a password, that could actually prevent you from coming into the country at the CBP officer's discretion. Uh, they are free to turn you away simply because you refuse to comply with their order. Um, even if you are a citizen, if you refuse to unlock your device or provide a password, CBP has the power to actually confiscate your device. And I'll touch upon, I'll get into that more in a little bit. However, if you do choose to unlock your device, that could open up some further consequences as well. Because um, unlocking the device could be seen as providing consent for the CBP officer to further search your electronic device and they've been known to take the device to clone it, to, or they might meddle with the information on it, or they can go in there and look at your social media accounts, your message history, and that could lead to further questions. So really, it requires the individualized case-by-case -case basis to assess your own, like, whatever information you might have, and whatever risk you think um, might outweigh the convenience factors. And I mentioned that refusal may lead to device confiscation by a CBP. Generally, Customs and Border Patrol policies do allow their officers to detain electronic devices for what they call a brief, reasonable period of time to perform a search. Generally, this is uh, for no longer than five days, uh, although they can extend this period for, I believe, up to 15 days at a time, uh, I think, with supervisor's uh, permission. If this occurs, if they do decide to confiscate your um, digital devices, um, you should politely demand what's called a property receipt. They should give you a property receipt saying, like, we uh, have your device and there should be some instructions on there on how and when to get it back. If that happens, though, um, please, you can also come to CARE or other organizations like uh, Asian Law Caucus for assistance with these sort of issues. So. What does this mean for us or for everyone in the community? Basically, the right time to start protecting yourself and your digital privacy is before any trip you might take. That's really key. You have to start protecting yourself before any trip that you might take. And the level, so I touched upon this a little bit before, but the level of protection at the border uh, and in airports really varies depending on a person's citizenship status. And this is just a brief summary of what I just touched upon. U.S. citizens cannot be denied entry to the United States for any reason, although refusal to comply with or to answer questions may lead to delays in the re-entry, but ultimately they cannot bar you from coming back in. Green card holders, similar. They cannot be refused entry unless the travel was not brief and innocent. Now, unfortunately, for foreign visa holders, they may be denied basically at the Customs and Border Patrol officer's discretion. But there are definitely actual more concrete steps that uh, all of us can take as travelers uh, to, pr to protect our digital information and privacy. Now, which steps you take might depend on how you balance risk versus convenience. Now, for maximum safety, there are definite steps such as, or in recommendations, such as not taking the primary electronic device you use to communicate, if possible. You can try to get a burner device, a cheap phone, uh, or a phone that's already been wiped free of the data, and then you can buy a cheap SIM card wherever you're traveling to abroad, and insert that into your old phone. And hopefully then that can uh, alleviate some problems. Uh, same thing with laptops. Uh, if you have a cheaper laptop with less information on it, and that's sufficient for your uh, for your purposes when you're traveling abroad, I'd be preferred to just to limit the amount of uh, data that your data that the government might be able to access when you're coming through the borders. Um, a good but not so great option is backup your device's data to a cloud-based service. Now, there's a 
for technical reasons that I'm not going to fully get into today. Um, you can upload data to a cloud and then try to completely erase what information is on your device before crossing the border. But there's then uh, some more tech savvy people in the audience might understand a little more about this, but then you're dealing with problems of transmitting the data into the, into the cloud and then you're dealing with encryption, like trying to make sure it's secure when you're uploading and downloading again. Um, and again, there might be some more residual issues because um, the government does have the technology to be able to, if, say hypothetically, they're able to get hold of your device and say they clone it, there is technology up there, out there that can look at what files you may have deleted if files were not deleted properly. So therein lies a different risk too. Now, um, if you're not able to do any of those, what's better than nothing is when you're going through security, put your phone on airplane mode and completely shut down your device, completely power down your laptop. That means don't put it in suspend, don't put it in hibernate, but make sure you turn it all the way off and also have a, a pa password on there too if possible. So what happens if you are, if a CBP officer does give you an order to uh, either say unlock your phone or provide a password? Now, unfortunately, like I mentioned earlier, it's hard to predict the, what the consequences of either complying would be or refusing might be. And that's really a, a question that each individual needs to like reflect upon themselves. Uh, what their immigration status, status is and balance the risk versus the convenience. However, if you do uh, comply with an order to unlock a device or provide a password, what you can consider doing is you can verbally tell an agent that you are complying under protest and also that you do not actually consent to their order to uh, either give up the password or to unlock the device. Uh, this won't stop them from this won't actually stop them from like taking your phone and or device and doing who knows what with it. But if later on you do try to assert a legal challenge in court, this could help defeat uh, if the government tries to claim that, oh, you unlocked the device for us or you provided the password willingly, so you consented. Saying, verbalizing the sort of protest might be, might do a little more uh, in terms of helping overcome that potential defense. And always, when dealing with law enforcement, always be firm, be firm, but also be polite. Some additional ways you can uh, protect yourself before traveling. Do you use strong passwords on your phones? So avoid using biometric passwords. I know a lot of people now, and especially those with iPhone X as well, um, it's really convenient to use a fingerprint or to do a face unlock, but for both technical and for legal reasons, the no. biometric passwords, Wait. fingerprints, no. and face recognition are a lot weaker. Um, are a lot weaker than actual like numerical or even or word-based passwords. So definitely avoid using biometric passwords and use strong passwords on your phones. Um, it's suggested that if you think uh, your phone might be in danger of being confiscated, and of course do this before you're actually at the airport, um, have a backup of all the sensitive information, phone numbers, critical phone numbers, any photos, and any other data. You should also log off your social media accounts on your devices before going through security. Uh, put your phone in airplane mode when going through security, and also, and or power down your devices completely and not just put them in sleep mode. So if, unfortunately, you are mistreated uh, going through security, some tips, just try to keep, the, keep these in mind at all times. Do not ever physically interfere, uh, that means resisting arrest or fight with any officers, no matter how rude, how inconsiderate they are to you. Stay calm and respectful, and these apply generally to any interactions with all sorts of law enforcement. Also, do not lie to a border agent. Like Sally mentioned earlier, it's a crime to make a false statement to a law enforcement officer who is asking questions as part of their job. And if you can, write down the officer's name, their badge number, and any other identifying information that they may have. And try to find other witnesses and try to get their contact information too so that they can corroborate your story. Okay. I'm going to touch a little bit upon uh, 
wearing religious head coverings while traveling. So this, and this is in the context of going through airport security. Uh, you can assert your right to wear religious head covering uh, if you're, but you might be asked to remove it before going through airport security screening. Um, if you do assert the right, you also might be subject to pat down. So if that happens, there's a right to request that the pat down be conducted by a person of the same gender, and also that the pat down occur in a private area. Uh, the government is required to give you a private screening by someone of your own gender as long as you ask for it. Now, in the case that you don't want the officer to actually touch your religious head covering, uh, you must assert that. You must refuse and actually tell them that you would prefer to pat down your own head covering. Um, but just know that afterwards, the officers may try to swab or rub your hands with a small cotton cloth which they will then take the cotton cloth and put it in a machine to, put, to test for chemical residue. Uh, generally, officers may not conduct additional screening, however, solely based on race, national origin, religion, gender, ethnicity, or your political beliefs. Though. And unfortunately, there's also been cases where uh, individuals traveling have been removed from flights, not by the government, but by the airlines and the carriers themselves. Um, the law here is that airline pilots may refuse to fly a passenger if they have reason to believe, based on observation, that the passenger is a threat to flight safety. Uh, however, the pilot can't actually refuse to allow you onto a flight because of ster stereotypes or because of bias. Uh, again, that might stem from religion, race, national origin, ethnicity, or political beliefs. And returning to the United States. Um, if you're a US citizen or you're a green card holder and you're in a foreign country and you're trying to fly back to the United States, but you've been denied the opportunity to board a flight uh, due to apparent inclusion on a no-fly list or some other secret government watch list, the government actually does have an obligation to help you return to the United States on a commercial flight. Now, there's, actually, there's quite a bit of secrecy surrounding no-fly lists the criteria for inclusion are often broad and vague. Some of the reasons that people um, might might know that they're on a no-fly list or a watch list is if they've been denied a chance to check in for a flight that they've already booked or purchased tickets for, or they are denied access to print boarding passes. Uh, in some cases, also when people have had their bank accounts closed randomly, that might hint towards uh, a larger scheme that they've been put on some sort of list. However, you can um, seek help from organizations like CARE and also seek help from organizations like Asian Law Caucus too. So one of the final things we um, want to touch on is the making charitable donations um, and CARP and its impact on your on CARP. Um, so CARP stands for the Controlled Application Review and Resolution uh, Program. And basically what happens there is that um, people in the community have been put on this list and essentially if there is um, any similarity between this list that they have, um, based on things such as um, like national security concerns, what will happen is that then if um, if someone is applying for naturalization and citizenship, um, being put on this um, on this CARP uh, program essentially will slow down the process of your immigration procedures. Um, so it's not a crime for you to make any charitable donations to any organizations unless the organization has been designated as a terrorist or organization under specific federal laws, or if you know, you yourself know that the donations you are making are going to further a terrorist activity as defined under federal law. Um, so again, it's not against, um, it's not a bad idea to make donations. Of course, um, I recognize that it's very common in the Muslim community to make those donations, so that's uh, certainly in my encourage that you do those. Um, but we also want to um, uh, make sure that you folks are mindful um, of the types of donations you're making. So if this is a new organization that you're donating to, 
be just be sure that it is a legitimate organization. If it's overseas, um, be very careful about that. If it's not one that is um, well recognized, keep receipts of all the donations you make. Um, because the FBI has um, records of lawful financial donations made to Islamic charities. And so CARP um, instructs the USCIS to uh, the officers to label applicants as national security concerns if they give lawful donations to certain large um, Muslim organizations. Um, if, if those charities are accused or convicted of suspicious or illegal activities. So if they have reason to believe that this this donation or this organization falls under some sort of um, suspicious activity, they will they will start to investigate and likely um, slow down the immigration process. So that is really important for you to know. Um, there have been a number of cases where um, a member of the community was labeled as a national security concern and had his naturalization application subject to the CARP because of the volunteer work and donations he was making to the Global Relief Foundation prior to its designation as a uh, financier of terrorism. So again, just be careful and mindful of who you make donations to. If they're ones that are new, just make sure that you've done your research on those programs. Um, you keep your receipts and you are um, just mindful of those of those programs. And if, you, if there are any suspicions that they might not be legitimate ones, be sure to um, just be careful of those types of donations. Um, but other than that, if that does happen for whatever reason, um, if you believe that your immigration status, or, if you, or sorry, if your immigration um, application for naturalization has been slowed down or has gone on for much longer than it typically um, is expected of these applications, um, it means that there's likely a chance that you may have been impacted. And so if that's the case, then be sure to contact CARE our Asian Law Caucus, and what we'll do is we'll work with you. I know Jeffrey's been working on some cases along those lines where um, we'll help you um, kind of assess and see how we can assist you in that process. Um, so kind of just this last point on that same, um, on that same note, uh, CARE now actually does um, offer immigrants rights um, services. So what we'll do is we, um, if you're non-citizen and you would like to become a citizen, we can help you with, those with that application process um, and um, you can contact us to see if you're eligible for naturalization. If you have uh, been a green card holder for five years, you are eligible to become a U.S. citizen. Or if you've been married to a U.S. citizen for three years, you are also eligible. Um, you can also contact us if you are seeking other forms of immigration relief, such as TPS or any adjustment of status. Um, and so if you have those questions, oh, uh, current beneficiaries of temporary protected status from Syria must renew their status by UCIS, uh, or status with USCIS by May 4th. Um, so you can contact CARE with any of those questions. So just know that we do offer those services now, and we do have pamphlets in the back at our table if you want to learn more about that. Um, but other than that, if you don't have any questions, um, that's our email. Um, I also have business cards in the back, um, and so feel free to contact our office to um, if you have any questions.